Hello, Internet. How are you doing? Um, I, <clears throat> I don't know if I told you the other week. There's a, I want to do a shout out to, well, let, me, let me find out what his name was. Um, so there was, was it Denmark? Um, hmm, who was it? I can't remember now. Oh, here it is, Lars. Big shout out to Lars in Denmark. Hi, thanks for watching. Um, good to know that people are watching our class from all around the world. Um, so anyway, um, so back to the dating site example. Yes. Um, so um, at the end of last week's, at the end of last week's lecture, I decided to get clever and do a lot of hard to understand stuff in a very little bit amount of time. So let's go back over what. <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going. Let's go back over what we were doing. And um, I have a couple of notes on some things that we, that we added there. So, um, actually, let's go back to the code. Um, I did a little bit of work on the code while, while, I was, um, while we weren't in class. I added all the uh, constants for all of these. Um, so now we have all 12 um, star signs in there. And, um, and so I wrote some slides here talk, talking a little bit about that. <coughs> um, so I said, we often use numbers to represent uh, other, other ideas in our code. And if we just have a bare number sitting on its own um, in the code, it's very hard to understand what that is. So if we just said that my sign equals 5, it's not clear what 5 is. I mean, it depends on, well, we're assuming that we're starting, we're counting, but it depends on whether we're counting from 0 or 1 and whether we start counting at Capricorn or Aquarius or somewhere else. And so saying my sign equals 5 while is a good way internally to represent that information, is not a good way to make your code readable. And this is what we call a magic number. It's a number in your code that, um, that has no apparent meaning, um, and thus is bad style. Um, so if any of your comments you get, this is a magic number somewhere, I mean, this is a number that I have no idea what it means. You should give it a name so that I can actually that, so make your code more readable. Um, and so the solution that, we, that I showed you for this was to actually give names to these constants. And the way we named the constants was by making uh, these, this kind of a declaration at the beginning, beginning of our code, where we said that um, Gemini was equal to 5, and, it, so, and then the rest of it, what we have here, is that Gemini is an integer. Um, it's all, we are, our constants are all in capital, capital letters to distinguish them from our other things to make it clear that Gemini is not, gonna, not a variable that can change, but a constant that, un, can un, that can't change. And then we have this business at the beginning, which says final and static. Um, and this is specifically how we distinguish uh, just a general variable from a constant. Um, final means that it can't change, that it's a read-only uh, value. So you can't write to a final variable. So Gemini is a, is a variable like any others, well, it's like, like every other kind of variable, except it's read-only. And so once we've assigned 5 to Gemini, we can never change it again. Um, so that's what final means. Static actually means that it's the same for all objects in a class. So all profiles in our case will have this same value Gemini on it, and that value will always be 5 on all of those things, on, on all profiles. Um, that's not, don't really need to worry too much about what static means in this case, other than the important thing is that... Um, is so, and then we have constant names all in uppercase. Um, so now we can, I'll get to what static means in a second. The fact that it's final means that we can use this, um, this variable, well, this constant in our code, um, and we can read its value anytime we want. So, for example, if we wanted to make my sign Gemini, um, we'd say my sign equals Gemini. And the value of my sign was now uh, 5 because Gemini is 5. So that's fine, we can read the value from Gemini and, and write it into my sign. But we can't do, the other, do it the other way around. We can't write values, a new value into Gemini because that, it's final. Um, and so final means I'm setting it now and you'll never be able to set it again. Um, so, uh, so we can't change the value of a constant. Thus, the name constant. Now the idea that they're static means that they, they actually belong to the class and not to the individual objects. So in a, in a normal, um, so the other fields that we have, so these fields down here, um, 
you, my username, my birthday, my star sign, these belong to every individual object. So every, every separate profile will have its own name, its own birthday, its own star sign. Right? Whereas these, because they're static, belong to the class. And so every object has the same value for Aquarius. Because obviously Aquarius is the same for your profile, for my profile, for someone else's profile. It's always the same. And so every, every profile will, have, will see the same value for Aquarius. Whereas my profile will have a different username to your profile, will have a different username to someone else's profile. Um, so the idea is that if they're static, then every single profile inherits the same value. Um, you'll really only be dealing with static constants, and so you don't particularly need to remember what static means, other than a constant is always static and always final. It's always final, meaning you can't change it. It's always static, meaning it's shared amongst all of the objects. Um, now, at the moment, we haven't actually included an access modifier here. We could make these private or public. Um, because they're... Um, because, like, so we normally make our fields private because we don't want people messing with our values. Um, so I don't want other people changing my username, so I, I keep my username private. But because these are read-only, there's no way for anybody else to change them. And so we can make these public, and so that other people can read these constants. And so what I'm going to go through here is make all of these constant, uh, all of these public. So this will be useful later um, when we want to create profiles uh, or read the, uh, the, when we want to read the, these, uh, the, the star sign of a profile later and compare it to these things. If these were private, then only the profile could use these constants. And so a, a, private, if a private constant can only be used internally to the class that defines it. A public constant can be used by everyone. Now obviously we're going to actually want to make, we're going to want to ask questions about a profile star sign from outside the profile. Um, and so we want these constants to be public so that other people, other, other methods, can actually know what, what the star sign means. So, so like I said, um, internally to the class, we can just use the, uh, the, name, of the, the name of the constant as a, as a value, and uh, we can read it and write it and do other things with it. Well, we can't write to it, but we can use it Sorry, let me get, be clear on what. We can read that value in the same way we could read a field uh, on that class. Uh, if we want to actually access it from externally, so if we make them public, we can access them externally, but in order to access them externally, we've got to do the same sort of thing as an external method call. We've got to tell, tell it where it's going to be found. So this, this constant Gemini is defined on profile, and so to, to access it internally to a profile, that's fine. The profile knows about the constant. To access it externally, we have to say profile.gemini. Um, so anything that isn't a profile which wants to access this has to say profile.gemini um, or profile.leo or profile or whatever. So I'll show, you, um, I'll show you another example of using that. Um, since we're now... Um, since we're now going to provide a date for the birthday and not just the year that you're born in, um, we could actually, we don't really need to provide the star sign as well. So if I'm, if I'm creating a new profile and you tell me your birth date, I don't need you to tell me your star sign as well because I should be able to calculate your star sign from your birth date, right? So rather than having this, we're actually got, not going to ask for that information anymore. We're going to get rid of that. We're still going to store the star sign but what we're going to do is we're going to say compute star sign uh, from your birthday. And right down here, I have written a method that does that. Ooh, and it's a long one. There it is. And what this does, all it is is a, is a big if statement. It says, it gets the, uh, goes to the, your birth date, asks for the day and the month, um, and I just put them in variables just because it's easier that, to type day and month than birth date or get day, birth date or get month all the time. And then there's the first if statement. There's, there's one long, long, long if statement there with 12 different cases in it. All right? And it says, if, if the month is January, 
then do this, otherwise if the month is February, then do that, otherwise if it's March, then do that, and so forth. So here we're using a constant defined in the Java API. This calendar.january is a constant. Um, it's defined on the calendar class. And so in order to use it, we actually have to, up, he up here, we have to import calendar. Okay, so now we've imported calendar, we can use things that are defined on the calendar. In, in this case, we want to use this definition of January, February, March, April, May, etc. Um, and but in order, because it's defined on the calendar class and not as part of the profile, to access these constants, we have to tell tell Java where we're getting that constant from. And so it's on calendar, and so we say calendar dot January in order to access that that field. And that's a constant on the calendar in the same way as we've defined constants on the profile for the star signs. Now, if um, if the birth if your birthday is in January then I check whether or not your birthday is before the uh, less than or equal to the 19th. If it's less than or equal to 19, you're a Capricorn, otherwise you're an Aquarius. Um, otherwise, if you're, not, if you're not born in January, if you're born in February, then, then it does another test to see whether you're an Aquarius or a Pisces. Otherwise, if you're not born in February, then if you're born in March, you do this. And we're using something that I haven't quite shown you yet, which is this this ongoing if statement where rather than um, normally I told you the if statements have two parts you either you either do one thing if it's true or another thing if it's false now we're doing this if statement that actually has 12 different parts and the way that we're doing it is is the first one says if something the next one says else if the next thing the next one says else if the next thing and so forth and so the first if the first one is true we run the first one Otherwise, if the second one is true, we run the second one. Otherwise, if the third one is true, we run the third one, and so forth. And so what that generally looks like, I think I wrote that here, not that page. Um, yeah, so sometimes we want to have more than two branches. Um, doing this, so there's just a simple three-branch case. Um, if x is less than 10, we do the first thing. If it's greater than 10, we do the second thing. If it's equal to 10, we do the third thing, right? So it might be three different cases depending on whether it's less, equal, or greater than. Now this, as we get more and more cases, if we keep doing this sort of, uh, if we do an else and then in, in braces another if, and then an else and another if, and an else and another if, it starts building out like in this direction and getting hopelessly nested. And it makes our code rather hard to read because there's lots of braces inside, lots of braces inside, lots of braces. Um, so there's a shorthand way that we handle these kind of cases which looks like that, where we can just say, if this is true, then whatever, else if, and then the second case, else, then the third case. So we've eliminated, in this case, we've eliminated one set of braces, rather than having else, and then a set of braces. So rather than having that, we've just taken out, we've taken out this set of braces, and just moved this whole statement up, and so the else becomes now part of that. And that's just, it's really just doing exactly the same thing, except it's doing it in a more compact way. And if we, in the case of our code, if we've got 12 things here, we'd be, have a horrible mess of braces, like nested, 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 nested 12 times, if we were doing, if we did it this way. So just doing it this way is much neater. Now the important thing to note here is that if the first case is true, it always does the first case, even if the second case is also true. So if I had code instead that looked like if x is less than 10, do the first case, else if x is less than 20, do the second case, this second case would only run for values between 10 and 20, right? Because the first case captures everything less than 10, and it doesn't, it doesn't do the second thing. The second thing is only else if. So this says... So there's two, let me show you two different cases. In fact, I'll make slides for this because it's important. Okay, so there's a difference between... Yeah. Done if x is less than 20.
n is less than e. Okay, so let me show you that. So in that case, it's just two separate if statements. So the first one is done if x is less than 10. The second one is done is if, if x is less than 20. So if x is, say, 5, both of those will be executed, right? Um, because 5 is less than 10, it does the first thing, then it comes to the second line and says, is 5 less than 20? Yes, it does the second thing. Okay? In that case, 5 is less than 10, so it does the first case, and the second case is ignored because the first case is done. So this is an else statement which is only executed if the first one is not true. In, the first, in this case, these are two completely separate statements, and so if the first one is done, uh, then it'll go on to do the second one. So it's easy to, to confuse these two things. Um, it's sometimes, it's neater to write, um, I mean, it would be less confusing if you wrote um, if x is greater, equal, greater than or equal to 10 and that code is, um, is clearer in the, in the sense that it's quite clear now that this second one only gets executed if x is greater than or equal to 10 and if it's less than 20. But it turns out the greater than or equal to 10 is unnecessary because we know that it's greater than or equal to 10 because the first case has already failed. Right. So let me I'll actually copy and paste that and put it into the, into the slides that we give out later. So um, so there. So that case and that case do exactly the same thing. Um, right? So, if we have uh, this, this, this cascading else where we have one and another and another, the first one that's true, uh, the first one that's true will execute. If we have separate if statements like this, then, then both of them will be considered separately. Um, and so we can use that cascading idea to avoid uh, having long else clauses like that, long if statements like that, because we know that the first case is going to be, uh, if, it, if x is greater than or equal to 10, well, sorry, if x was less than 10, then the first case would execute. So the second case is only going to execute when x is greater than or equal to 10. And so, that'll ne um, so that part of the condition isn't necessary. And so we can write that. Um, the last thing that I want to cover about what we did last time, um, I threw in this date package, which, um, this date class, which you hadn't seen before. Um, forgive me for throwing things in the lecture at the last minute. This was me changing my mind while I'm, ex while I'm lecturing. Um, the date class is again part of the Java API. It's in the Java util package like everything else we've been looking at so far. So if you want the docs for it, they're there. Um, like every other thing from the Java API, we have to import it if we want to use it. And um, the important things that it provides, it has, um, well, it has a bunch of constructors, but two of them are important for what we want to do. Um, the, if we don't provide any arguments to the constructor, the first constructor always provides today's date, so it can look up today's date and just provide you with a date object that has that information. The second constructor that we'll use in a bit is to create a date with a specific year, month, and day. And, for so, and because it's an American thing, they write them in the year, month, day order rather than the day, month, year order or whatever. At least they don't write them in month, day, year, which is the most confusing standard I've ever come across. Um, so, so we can create either a date that is today's date or a date for a specific day in history. So getting back to our code, I'm going to add something here where I'm not going to explain it to you um, because I just realized there's a problem in that code, but I'm not going to worry about why that is. Um, so this piece of code here, this compute star sign, uh, so there's another thing we should have here. Um, there's a case here which should never happen. If we should return a date, if, if not, none of these things are true, we should return something. Um, we're going to return, actually, we're going to say system.out.println impossible day, uh, month, because we should always, have, but the Java just needs to be sure that we're always going to go somewhere, and we're going to return negative one. I'm not even going to explain that for the time being. Um, the important thing from, from this example is, is both the use of constants and the use of uh, this cascading if. And, and one thing that's worth noticing here, noting here, the value of calendar.january 
you don't need to know what that number is, right? You don't need to know whether, whether the month January is represented by the number 1, by the number 0, by the number 259. It could be any value you want. Um, you just use the name calendar January and you know that it's referring to January. Shh, quiet down. Okay. Um, in fact, it's actually, I think, 0 for some reason or other. We count months from 0 because we're computer programmers. The other thing to note here is that, um, is that I could have put all that code here in the constructor. Um, quiet, please. I could have put all that code here in the constructor uh, rather, than, um, rather than in a separate method, but that would have made my constructor long and hard to read. Um, and so I broke it out into a method all of, of its own just for the sake of abstraction. Um, so that now my, me my constructor just says compute star sign from birthday. Um, rather than saying, rather than having that enormous several pages of code there in the constructor. So the constructor is easy to read and the, the complicated details are hidden away somewhere else. And that's abstraction. Um, basically, in a nutshell, abstraction is making this thing easier to read and, and hiding the, the concrete, concrete details somewhere else. Um, so anyway, that was, um, that was the date, uh, this class. Uh, so then we were working on, when I left you, we were working on the get age thing. So what we did was we got a date. We used the, the no argument constructor here to get a date that is today's date. We calculated their age by looking at the current year minus the birthday year. Um, but then we realized that that could be wrong if, the, um, if their birthday was later on in the year. And so we bid this bit of code here to correct that. So this could be one year too many. Um, if, if your birthday was in December, um, then this would be too, one year too many. And so we put a clause here saying, OK, if your, if your birthday month is greater than the current month, then we subtract one from your age. Um, now, the other case is if, it's, if your birthday is this month, but it happens later on in the month. So if your birthday is, is this month, which has said that your birthday month is equal to this month, and if your birthday date is greater than today's date, then, then we'll also subtract one. So we're saying, okay, we get, to guess your age, we're just going to subtract your birth year from the current year, and we get a number, but that number could be one too many. It could be one too many if your birthday is later this year in a different month, or it could be if your birthday is in a later day this month. And so we've got two, two methods for catching that. And I just checked the API. Um, if we go back and look at the calendar API, uh, the calendar web, uh, the, sorry, the date. This is the date class. I just need to check that I got that method right. Yes, it is get date. Right. Okay. That's cool. I wasn't sure whether this was get date or get day. So, um, so this should work. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to move on. We heard that we already did accessor methods for all these things. The last thing we want to do is, um, okay, so we want to do mutator methods for set likes cats and set likes dogs. That's really easy. We take in a parameter, a Boolean parameter, which is whether you like cats or dogs, and we can say my likes cats equals likes. Right? So we, these are just a simple method that, that allows us to set that value to whatever we want. It's only true or false. We can say my likes dogs equals likes. Um, so that's easy. Now the complicated thing is going to be this um, blocking users. I'm going to actually grab this. Um, okay. So, like I tell you normally to, to group your code by accesses and, and mutators, but in this case it's actually probably better for us to group out, to rearrange our code, to put all the stuff to do with blocking together. So I'm going to move this down here, just because it'll look, it'll be easier to keep it all on one screen. Um, So, I mean, how you arrange your code is really up to you as long as it makes sense. Um, user blocking code. So this section is just going to be where we put all our user blocking code. So we, if you remember, we were, we're keeping, we're keeping, we're keeping, here we go. We have an array, a field, my blocked users, which is who, who's blocked on this account. Um, and that's an array of strings. So we're keeping a list of people's usernames if they're blocked. And when we constructed a new profile, 
we set that to the empty list. And so initially nobody is blocked. And what we're going to do is as we add names, as we've got more people who are, who are blocked, we're going to add names to that list and or remove names if we want to unblock anybody. All right. So if we want to block a, new, a, a user, here we have a username. Um, we can do my blocked users. And all we have to do is add that username to the list. And that adds somebody to be a, new, a, a blocked user. And if we want to remove a blocked user, well, removing a blocked user is a little bit more complicated. We'll get to that in a second. If we want to check if somebody's blocked, um, we can say, um, so the array list, let's go back to the documentation again. Um, and let's look for the docs for array list. Where's the frames version of this? There we go. Ah, there we go. Um, somewhere in here, there's an enormous, this is all the classes that are out there. Somewhere in here is array list. There we go. Array list has, uh, here we go. Array list has a method called contains, which is really handy. This actually will tell us return true if the list contains a specified element. Actually, let's not do that. Let's, let me show you how you would implement contains if it wasn't already there. So what we could do, we could just say return, um, return my blocked users dot contains user, right? And that would tell you, that would call the, it would go to the my blocked users list and call the contains method and tell me whether that, that method, tell me whether that list contains that username. And this would be all easy, and you wouldn't have to do anything else. This returns a Boolean. This method returns a Boolean. If you look back up here, contains, whoops, contains returns a Boolean. It says public Boolean contains. And so it's either true or false. And if it's true, then we return that true value. And if it's false, we return the false value. So we just have to return the um, whatever value is that, that tells us. Um, Let's assume that we don't have that, so that because I want to show you how we'd actually work do that for ourselves. So what we're going to do instead is this. Okay, um, we're going to say uh, I'm going to have a variable, a boolean, a local variable which is found, and I'm going to say initially we haven't. This is going to keep track of whether we found somebody on the list, and what we're going to do is if we find somebody, we're going to return. So initially, this is going to be false, that so we don't know if somebody's there. But we're going to look through the list and see if we can find them. OK, so to illustrate what, what I have in mind to do, rather than to do it in code first, here I have a list of, here I have a list of names. This is my blocked users. And it has, it has a list of entries. It has. Whoever this is doesn't like me, and whoever this is doesn't like um, somebody else, doesn't like Claude. You don't want any, and it maybe also doesn't like Morgan. So whoever this is really doesn't like anyone from this class to, to access their profile. I'm sorry, Morgan, but that's just the way it is. Um, so what I want to do is actually, I've got a list, I've got a name here, um, Claude. And I want to check whether the name Claude is on this list. Now, because this is an array list, I could just ask it. The array list has a contains method, which will just tell me the answer. But what I want to do is say, well, how would we solve that ourselves? Quiet, please. Over that side. I don't want to throw chalk at you. I don't have very, I don't have very good aim, and I might hit somebody next to you, and that would be bad. Um, so what I, what I need to do is to check this is basically I can't look at the whole list in one go. I can only look at the list element by element. So what I need to do is iterate through this list in a loop, looking at the first thing, then the second thing, then the third thing, until I find either a match. So either first of all, I say, is Claude equal to Malcolm? And say, well, no, Claude and Malcolm aren't the same. So this is not, this is not true. Then I say, is Claude equal to Claude? And I say, yes, Claude is equal to Claude. Um, and so I found a match. And so I can return true and say, yes, this user is blocked because I found a match here. Um, the alternative is to, if I get to the end of the list, so if I'm, say, I'm looking for sim, to pick, um, first of all, I say, is sim equal to Malcolm? No. Is sim equal to Claude? No. Is sim equal to Morgan? No. I got to the end of the list, and, and I haven't found a match. 
and so I can say fault, return false and say no, sim isn't blocked. So there are two cases. One, either I go through and find somewhere on the list a matching element, or I get to the end of the list and don't find a matching element. So if I find a match, I can immediately stop and say yes, yes, there's a match. If I don't find a match, if I get all the way to the end and don't find a match, then I can stop and say no, that user isn't blocked. So in fact, I don't need to do what I just did, so we can get rid of that variable. Um, so what I want to do is iterate over everything in that array list. Uh, and to do that, I'll use a for each loop, because that's the standard way of iterating over an array list. And all the things in that list are strings. And, I, and we're going to create a local variable to stick that in. So we're going to take things off the list, or not, we're going, we're going to look at things on the list and put them into the variable name. And we're going to iterate from my blocked users. Right. So what this says is go through every entry of my blocked users, copy it into the variable name, which is a string, and do something with that name. Um, and so now we have a local variable name. Um, now what we want to do is say um, is, so we want to check if this user is the one we're looking for. So we're going through every name on the list and checking whether it's the one we want, one we're looking for. And uh, so we say if, um, no, I'll, um, so this is where it becomes tricky. Um, and unfortunately, this is where Java gets annoying. If you remember in earlier weeks, I said that, um, that if we compare, if we do this, if name equals user, so, so name is the, the one that we're drawn from the list. User is the, is the argument that we're searching for. Um, what we want to do is say, if the name is equal to user, then return true. Because we've found, we've found the name we want, and so we can stop now. We can return because we found the, the person we were looking for. They are blocked, so we can return true. And so this stops immediately and doesn't keep going around the loop. It just, it just stops straight away. There's a problem with this. Oh, so then, if we don't find, let me finish that. If we don't find them, if we go all the way through the list and don't find anybody, then when we get to here, we're going to return false. Um, so the idea is we look at every name, we check whether that name is equal to the username we've been given. If it is, we return true. Otherwise, we go around, check the next name, and the next name, and the next name, and the next name. If we've checked all the names and none of them have returned here, then we'll get to here and we'll return false, saying we haven't found the person we're looking for. Um, so it's very simple. We're just looking through the list, looking for a name, and then, and then returning true if we find it, and false if we don't. There's one problem, um, and the problem is that a string is an object and not a primitive type. Um, and you remember that I said, and this is annoying, but remember that I said earlier that if, if we compare two objects, we're actually comparing their references not their values. So let me show you what that might mean. If I have, if I have a profile here, and it has, and it's a profile with the name Malcolm, and maybe some other details, but let's just keep it down to a name. Then if I have another profile here that is also, that is also Malcolm, and it might have exactly the same details here. So it might have, you know, that I was born in 1973. This one might have also have that I was born in 1973. So these are two different objects that have the same values, right? So if I have here a variable, um, let's just call this variable A. That's a variable, and it, it's, a, um, it's a reference to this profile. Actually, this, let's make this the variable user. It's a reference to that profile. And I have a variable here. Um, actually, call that user1, and we'll call this one user2. And that's a reference to that profile. Okay. If I ask whether user1 is equal to user2, it'll say no. And the reason why it says no is that it's not comparing these values to these values. It's comparing this arrow to this arrow. Shh. Right? These two arrows are, different, are pointing to different things, and so user one does not equal, those two are not equal, right? Because even though they have the same value, they're pointing to different things. Right. If we had this situation, 
where user one is a variable pointing to this profile and user two is a variable pointing to that same profile, then these two things are equal. Um, so only two objects are only equal when they're the identical object. So, so when, we, when we're talking about integers or other primitive types, this equals equals means are these two, do these two things have the same value? But when we're talking about objects, and including when we're talking about strings, because strings are objects, this means are they identical? Are they pointing to exactly the same object? Not do they have the same value, but are they actually the same thing that's flooding out there? And in this case, we don't know for sure that these two strings are going to be the same. They could be two strings with the same value. With the same value. So this is a problem. And the way we solve this problem is that rather than using equals equals, we have to say is equal. Actually, no, we say, oh, let me check. I always forget this. It's in here. We look for the string type. All the way down to the bottom. How are we going time-wise? All the way down here somewhere. There is the documentation for string. String, there it is, string. And, and it has a method called, let's find, find equal, no, not that one, equals, there it is, okay. So it has a method to tell us to do it for us. So we can't just, we can't just do that, we can say, but we can say equals that. Um, so because, well, because we don't know whether these two string objects are, are the, exactly the identical string object or, are, or just different ones with the same value, we can ask, what, we ask name to, to check whether it's equal to user. And because name knows all its personal details, um, it can give us that answer. It can actually look at, look at its internal values and look at the internal values of user and see whether they match up. Um, so. When we're comparing strings, and I hadn't realized that this was going to be the case when I wrote this example, when we're comparing strings, we need to use equals rather than the, than the double equal sign thing. Um, this is confusing and annoying, but important, because if you do it the other way, if the annoying thing is if you use the equals equals, sometimes it will work, because sometimes you'll have the identical string, and sometimes it won't work because you've, just got, you've got two different strings with the same value. Um, so you've just got to remember to use the dot equals thing. Um, it's annoying. It's one of those weird little quirks of Java, but you'll get used to it. You have to get used to doing it. Um, right. But this is a good example, um, otherwise, of how to do stuff with lists. Um, typical, a typical kind of uh, operation that you'll do on a list is you want to check whether something's on the list. So you'll iterate through every object performing some test. And when you find the uh, when your test becomes true, you'll stop and return true. And if your test if you get all the way to the end and you don't find and none of the tests become true, then you'll have some other result. Um, the other thing is note what happens if the my block users list is empty. Um, then the first thing it does is come here, tries to get a name off my block users. There is nothing on the list, so this this whole loop never executes, and it goes straight to here and returns false. So if the my block users list is empty, um, it'll, it'll always return false, and so it'll never say anyone's blocked, which is the right thing to do. If the block, block users list is empty, then no one is blocked. Um, you should, in, in any kind of list operation, you always need to think, take a moment to think to yourself, what happens if the list is empty? Will my code still do the right thing? Um, and in this case, it's fine. Uh, if the list is empty, it'll always return false, which is exactly what we want. Okay, how are we going? We've got 10 minutes left. Cool. So then to unblock a user, we actually need to find whether the user's on the list and, and then remove the user from the list. So we need to do the same sort of thing. I'm going to use a different kind of loop here, though. What I'm going to use is... Um, we're going to use a for, uh, a for loop like this, and we're going to iterate over counting them by number. Because when we want to remove somebody, we want to remove them by their position on the list. So we're going to say for i equals 0, i is less than uh, my blocked users dot length. Uh, no, sorry, dot size. 
That is annoying. Okay. Okay. So this loop is going to count from zero up to the size minus one. Um, so it's going to keep counting until it hits size. It's going to stop when it hits size. Right? So if we've got a list of three things, this is going to count 0, 1, 2, and then when it hits 3, it's going to stop. Um, if, uh, if we have a list of 0 things, it's just going to 0 and immediately stop because 0 is not less than 0. Uh, my blocked users.size is going to be 0, and so this is going to say, uh, is 0 less than 0? No, not do anything. Okay, so this counts through everything in the list. So down here, we actually wanted to just, we just wanted to look at every single element, and so we used a for each loop. Up here, we're actually interested in, in what number of element we're looking at, because to remove an element from a list, we can only remove them by number. And so to find, so what we want to do here now, let me go back to my example on the board, we want to remove Claude from the list, right? So what we need to do, we can only remove elements by knowing where on the list they are, first of all. So what we need to do is say, is Claude equal to Malcolm? No. Uh, so is Claude equal to the element at zero? No. Is Claude equal to the element at 1? Yes. And so Claude, shh, quiet. So then Claude is at 1, so then we want to remove the thing at 1. And we'll cut that one out, and the list will automatically renumber itself. Um, so if Claude is not on the list, we want to count 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. We'll get to 3, and we'll say that Claude isn't found, and we'll we won't have to remove anything. Right? So, what we want to do here is say, again, get the name of the person at that point. So, we need to say, um, my blocked users dot get i. So, that method gets that n the name of the person at that point. Um, so, it gets person 0, then gets person 1, then gets person 2. We want to write that into a, into a variable. Now we want to do the same as we did below, which is say if name dot equals, in this case, uh, let's go change that one back to user. There we go. If name dot equals user. So the same thing as we were doing before, we're comparing two strings, and so we need to use dot equals. And if we have found the person, then we can say, um, then all we need to do is remove them from, we, so we'd say found the person remove them from the list. And so we can say my blocked users dot remove. And so now we need to provide the number of the element that we're removing. In this case, i is going to be the number of the element. Um, and if we found them and removed them, when, then we can immediately return. So we'll stop there. Otherwise, there's nothing... Not, and otherwise, if we get through the end of the list, um, didn't find user do nothing. Um, so this is slightly more complicated. Let me go through it. Actually, uh, let me go through it on the board because uh, we can't run the code at this moment. So we start out with our user. This is our user, Claude. We create... Um, we create an integer i, and we create a variable, a, a variable name. And these are just two local variables that we're using for working. Right? We start out by initializing i equals 0, and we say, first of all, is 0 less than the, list, the length of the list? The length of the list is 3, so 0 is less than 3, so we can, so we can go. So the for statement executes. Then the first thing we do is we say, get, we ask my block users to get the element at zero. So we say, get the element which is currently indexed by i, which is zero. So this becomes Malcolm. I'm going to not write my. And then we, so this name is now Malcolm. So now we're up to here. We've just done that. Now we say, is name equal to user? So is Claude equal to Malcolm? No. So we don't, so we skip that if statement. And, and it's the end of the for loop, and so we go back up to the for loop, top of the for loop. And now we add one here. 
We check whether 1 is less than 3, it is, and so then we get the name at position 1. So then we get, we copy this into here. We then do, we then do the if statement again, is Claude equal to Claude? In this case, it's true, Claude is equal to Claude. And so the if statement executes. We then ask blocked users to remove the element at, at position, the position given by i. And so we're removing the element at position 1. And so then it completely nukes that. And what happens is that it, because it's a list, it shrinks and it moves Morgan up to there. And it returns because it's finished. Claude has been unblocked. Our job is done. Um, so if we run that again, if we try to remove Claude again, um, we start here again, we, we initialize i to 0. 0 is in this case less than 2, and so we run. We copy Malcolm into here. We say, is Claude equal to Malcolm? No, and so we, we go around again. We increment i to 1. We copy Morgan into here. We say is Claude equal to Morgan? No. And so we increment i to 2. 2 is now not... So then we test is 2 less than 2. No, that fails, and so the loop stops. Um, the loop stops, we get to the end of the method, nothing happens, we're all finished. So if we try to remove a name from a, who, which isn't on the list, um, nothing happens, it doesn't change anything at all, which is the right thing to do, again. Okay, well, time's up for today. Um, I'm going to continue on this example a little bit more next time. Um, that'll be your last lecture with me as well. We might have some time for questions if, next week, so if you have any things that you're confused about um, that you want to ask me about, we'll do that in lectures next week. So come prepared. See you guys later.